You said that 75% of climbers will hit a major plateau in their climbing progression before V6. In that survey, it looks like the most common answer was that V5 is where the major plateau is. If you follow me through this climbing session, I will show you what needs to change in order to avoid this dreaded plateau. If you've got to this point in your climbing and you're climbing around V4 or V5, you should by now at least have a decent warm up dialed into your sessions. However, if you don't have a warm up which addresses muscular recruitment and joint range of motion, you're missing a massive part of the puzzle. Warm ups are there to maximize the performance of your session. And if you limit the performance you can achieve within any given session, you're limiting the potential gains and this will hinder your progress. Set yourself up for success at the very beginning of your session. A good warm up should follow the ramp protocol. This is raise, activate, mobilize, and potentiate. That last one is really trying to recruit your maximal strength. This is gonna mean when you start climbing, you can apply your strength in a good way. We're gonna to skip to the next bit now, but if you wanna see more on warm-ups, let us know in the comments below. If we are talking about breaking past the V5, V6 range in your climbing progression, we need to talk about hangboarding because this is gonna play a crucial role in your progression in the next coming years. Our remote finger strength tests have reached over 1,800 different climbers and that data suggests that the average V5 male climber is hanging 132% on a 20 mil edge. This can be much lower and to be honest, if it was below 114%, this is one standard deviation, that's really where I'd be thinking this is definitely gonna limit your performance in the next grades up above V5. This metric means that they're holding body weight plus 32% of that body weight added to themselves. So this would be using a weight belt. Remember, this is an average. And if we look at one standard deviation below that, it's 114% where you're definitely gonna be an outlier of this group of V5 climbers. When you're below this, it's certainly gonna be something that you want to focus on improving to push past this boundary in your grades. And for our female data set, this average actually drops by a whole 10%. So we're not seeing as much finger strength required relative to body weight for the female data set. And I suspect the main physical difference between these two different groups in our data is flexibility, with increases in flexibility almost immediately improving how efficiently you can move and the technique options that are available to you. The reason I'm talking about hangboarding before we start climbing is generally this type of training needs to be performed at very high intensity and before you've fatigued your forearms to really see the most benefit. So this means it might go before your climbing session or it might be done maybe six hours before a climbing session or on a separate day. So if hangboarding is gonna be something that's really important to your progression, we'll go through a really simple session now. This session is a max hang session. The intention is to gain maximum strength in my fingers. It doesn't mean the hangs are gonna be maximal. I'm actually gonna be looking for a eight or nine out of 10 RPE. I never should be failing in these hangs because that's not needed to see good gains in strength. I'm gonna pick a 20 mil edge. I'm gonna be sticking to a half crimp grip for this session. That's the grip I want to be training, but you can choose different grip positions as well. The overall session structure is a five second hang followed by two minutes of rest. And I'm gonna be doing six sets of that at my working weight. So I'm gonna build up to a challenging weight and then maintain that for six sets. Earlier I mentioned about building up to my working sets. So doing six sets at the weight I want to be hanging at. But I'm not gonna be able to just jump straight into that. I'm gonna to have to build up. Maybe I'm even hanging with my feet still on the floor, so less than my body weight, doing body weight hangs and then gradually, incrementally building up that weight. Generally for me, I'm gonna probably do six to eight sets, at least just building up to my working sets, but that will kind of depend on how quickly you warm up. I think another important thing to mention as well with hangboarding is if you are climbing V5, V6, but you're not hitting that 130, 135%, it doesn't matter. You can start anywhere with this. It can just be building up to doing five second hangs at body weight. That can definitely be a starting point. You wanna build up to this over months. Finger strength is a thing that takes a long time to build for a lot of people. It's also worth mentioning whenever we talk about numbers or these benchmarks where people try and try and achieve them, to get to V5 or whatever, it's not like that number allows you to climb V5. If you're climbing V5 and you can only just hang body weight on this, that's excellent. It shows that you have plenty of other skills. Maybe it's tactics, movement, it might be just shoulder strength. Lots of things are gonna get you up a climb. So you don't have to aim for a number to climb hard. But what it might suggest is that if you improve your finger strength, you might see that very quickly transfer to your climbing because that might be a weakness in your climbing. That's all we're trying to look at and see where you might stand in strengths and weaknesses. 
I'm now going to be stepping over to do some board climbing. Now the board is going to play a big role in your progression, particularly in the higher grades. I think if you look at V8, V11, more and more climbers are going to be using this as a tool for their training. But the board certainly isn't like a beginner's tool. So if you've started climbing and you've reached that V5, V6 level, the chances are a lot of people have started on the commercial set, the normal set, but haven't ever tried the moon board. And a massive, really good tactic for strength training is changing up the stimulus. So if the board is something new to you, this is an excellent thing to try to push straight past a plateau. Having said that, I have a couple caveats which I think apply to board climbing. Firstly, I wouldn't be doing something like this, which is very finger intensive, if I've just done some heavy hangboard sets, particularly if either of these tools are new to your training. The other thing is that some boards are really hard from the start. Like the easiest thing up it can feel like V5. And personally, I think if you're gonna start using a board as a training tool, you need to be able to at least establish five or six like warm up climbs on it before you can start using it effectively as a tool. I don't think the easiest way up the board should be a session or a multiple session project for you. So training boards come in all shapes and sizes. Today we're using a moon board. If you have a moon board or something like it, like a kilt board or a tension board, they come with an app. They're linked to basically a community so you can have other people set climbs that you can try. This is super fun and actually have become pretty addictive. There's like the whole board training community which start climbing on this more than anything else. But it doesn't have to be a systems board with light setup or anything. It could just be a spray wall or a woody. But the main benefit of a board like this is that it's very kind of one dimensional climbing and that takes out a lot of the skill element to it so that it really distills down the physical attributes of climbing, particularly in the fingers and the upper body. That being said, board climbing still has its own skill set, which will take time for you to get used to. And it is excellent at developing certain skills like tension through your toes and into your fingers, really connecting the whole chain through the body. So in this session, I'm gonna be doing some project boulders. I'm essentially just gonna pick three different boulders and I'm gonna spend 10 minutes on each of those boulders, taking a good five to 10 minute rest in between each boulder. So I'm fully recovered for the next one. As well as the board being an excellent tool for training the basic physical attributes like raw power, rate of force development in the fingers. It's also excellent for the good tactics that come around training and good progression in the long term. Progressive overload, which is that it's very measurable and very consistent. You will be able to try the same boulder problem for years if you wanted to and you can measure your progress based off like a good set of benchmarks on the moon board or just having that warm up set. You'll be able to judge how you're feeling from week to week and month to month on that set of boulder problems. Another important tactic when it comes to using a board is you're gonna be exposed to small holds and the harder you climb, the smaller the holds get. So a big tactic to pay attention to is using good chalk, which brings me to the sponsor of this video. An important part of progressing into the higher grades is paying attention to your tools. A widely accepted version of this is climbing shoes. You always see good climbers wearing advanced and more technical pairs of shoes because they need that tiny surface of area to provide enough friction for their footwork. The same is true for good chalk. If you want to climb harder, you're going to have to use smaller holes or worse holes like slopers. So the friction between your fingertips and the wall is one of the most important aspects you can pay attention to when you're looking for good tools to progress your climbing. Magdust is absolutely some of the best chalk I've used. It's some of the best chalk on the market. And if you want to reduce slippage, improve your friction, and also make your skin last longer in your sessions, it's definitely a product you should try out. As I said at the beginning of the video, a good warm up will pay dividends in how well your session goes and each session after that. It's the same with good chalk. If you can improve the difficulty of your climbing because you're not slipping as much on holds, if your skin lasts longer so you can get more volume into your sessions, you're going to get a better and stronger training stimulus session after session and it will only speed up your progression in climbing. So buying some Magdus for your next climbing session might be the easiest way to invest in better your climbing with absolutely no effort needed. And if you want to do that completely free, you can win yourself a year's supply of Magdus by going into the link in our description and clicking to enter that competition. And as a final point, if Magnus uses it, it must be good chore. So go enter the competition. So far we've talked about really good ways to get more intentional intensity into your training, that being the hangboard or something like a moonboard. 
However, the uncool brother to intensity is training volume. And that is also a really important tactic that we're gonna to wanna to increase as we try and get better and better at climbing. It's a really important way of progressive overload in our training. And the thing with hangboarding or board climbing, if it's relatively new to you, you're definitely gonna to wanna to keep the volume of that low. It should be high intensity, but low volume. But your climbing still needs to maintain a decent amount of volume. And that's where we're gonna come over to a different part of the climbing wall where our fingers are gonna be a little bit less targeted. We can work a little bit more on skill, more bigger muscle groups in our body. So at this point in my session, my fingers are definitely tired, but my body's still got quite a bit more to give. I definitely wanna do a little bit more climbing for fun. So I'm gonna move over to the commercial set. Just another quick note on the concept of training volume in your climbing. If you think about it, a V5 climber and a V10 climber might both operate at 80, 90% of their max on any given training session. They both can achieve a high relative intensity to their training. But the difference between that V5 and V10 climber often comes in the amount of training volume they do. That V10 climber is probably doing a lot more climbing than the V5 climber. That volume needs to be progressive though. It doesn't happen overnight. The more you train, the more your training tolerance increases, the more well you can recover from your training sessions. So it's a much more holistic approach when we talk about training volume. The session I'm gonna do now we call five by three SI or strength intervals. And the concept of this session is we're gonna drop the intensity quite a bit from what we were doing on the board. And we're gonna pick five boulder problems and we're gonna do them three times each, resting about two and a half minutes between each one. So that's one rep down. I'm gonna rest two and a half minutes and then do it two more times. So three reps in total. And then I'm also gonna do five boulders overall after this. So I'm gonna rest five minutes after I'm done with this boulder and pick four more boulder problems. Another reason I really like this session is because you have a little bit of pressure to repeat a boulder problem multiple times, and it always gives you that opportunity for refining and learning the different movements. So first time I had read the boulder, but probably not very well. And then each time I do it, I'm gonna try and do it better. So I'll be getting slightly more tired, but I'll also be getting more efficient each time. At this point, there's probably a few questions about what about skill practice? How are we gonna to continue to train our skill? Because this is an ongoing thing at every point in your climbing journey. The stronger you get, the fitter you get, the more flexible you get, the more your movement has to catch up with these physical attributes because they will afford you more opportunities in climbing. As we had put in our beginner's bouldering guide video, there is a few tactics or sessions that you can use for deliberate practice at the beginning of your session. At this stage in your climbing, V5 to V6, it's unlikely that there's gonna be any glaring techniques which you don't know about. It's all gonna be about refining that within your climbing. So the tactics we're gonna talk about today is stuff that you'll see good climbers doing to work on their skill on particular climbs and moves. The first one of those being video analysis and just videoing themselves. This isn't necessarily a vanity thing, although it might end up on Instagram, but if you watch these videos back, you should be able to see where you are making inefficiencies or look for different opportunities from that third person perspective. And this can also work if your friends or other climbers sort of spot things and give you advice, obviously in a friendly way. I think another really underrated skill as well for developing your strengths and working your weaknesses is setting problems using all sorts of holes on the wall to try and work things that you want to address in your climbing. So an example here is we might be wanting to work narrow compressions so I can see a number of features I can use and make up my own climbs. So here we have this big volume feature which is going to be perfect for working on narrow compression and this I particularly don't like very much but it's a really cool one for getting that engagement in all these short positions. I'm definitely the type of climber that likes to just be open and drag everything. So this is, yeah, a really cool problem actually. It's climbing really well. I've just got to like, get really tight on that heel. This also tends to be a habit of really good climbers when they get to a level where you're gonna quickly climb out a circuit in the gym and then it's really hard to break into that next barrier so you know making it into the yellow circuit here or making it into the orange circuit we can take holds from the previous circuits and set really hard climbs for us which is also going to address a specific thing 
If you've made it to V5, the chances are you've had an injury or at least you've been threatened by an injury. Unfortunately, it's not gonna get any easier as you push yourself more to climb harder. However, luckily the research is pretty clear on the best strategy to mitigate injury risk. And that is by getting stronger. Essentially, the stronger your joints are, the more capable they are at tolerating the load and punishment you throw at them during your climbing sessions. To gain strength in your joints, one of the best ways of doing this is to go to the gym and start moving some weights around. Your wrists, elbows, shoulders, hips, and knees will all benefit from you supporting them with strength in the gym. If we just look at one metric that we test, for example, like we did with the finger strength testing, with the pull-up, and we test a two rep max pull-up, we're typically seeing a V5 climber pulling 133% in our male data set and 130% in our female data set. So there are some rough guidelines about what we typically see for this group of climbers. Again, you don't need to hit these benchmarks to climb a certain grade. I pretty much never hit any of these benchmarks for the grade when I've been climbing it, but it is just something to be aware of. If you're much further below that, it's probably a weakness that's worth addressing if you want to progress. If you're much further above it, it's probably not worth much extra time and you could be spending your time elsewhere. If we're looking at the pull-up, of course, first you should get down a good form body weight pull-up, but generally for climbers, we're gonna be progressing to weighted pull-ups. And so that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to be looking at a rep range of six to eight repetitions for three to four sets. And with this, we're trying to operate around 80% of our maximum. And for these sets, we're looking to keep one or two reps in reserve so that we're not properly going to failure, but we are in close proximity to it. Other than the big compound movements and lifts that we're going to do for climbing, like pull-ups and deadlifts, we think at this stage, it makes a lot of sense to start putting more focus into our supplementary or isolation exercises, which are going to work on some of the smaller muscle groups and fixators of the joints. So if we're thinking about the shoulder, it'll be the rotator cuff. This is partly because as you're climbing harder, you're probably going to want to narrow down focuses and weaknesses that you're now more aware of in your body. But also the climbing and setting style is going to be throwing at more weird or adventurous moves, like things like deep gastons, which probably just aren't around in the V0 to V3 range. The list of supplementary exercises seems endless. There's literally hundreds of muscles we can probably think of hundreds of exercises for. So a few examples of this would be rotator cuff would be seated external rotations. If we're thinking the hips, maybe we're thinking of hip flexor raises to strengthen the hip flexors. And for the forearm, we can think about supination and pronation exercises. I was listening to a podcast the other day with a amazing climber, Ned Feely, who is also the owner of Beastmaker and an all-round hero. And when he was asked what he thought most climbers should be doing more of, which they aren't currently doing. He said stretching. Now, I'm also a big advocate of stretching and being more flexible. You'll have noticed that if you watch a lot of these videos. And so the final part of this video, which might be the most important if you're asking me, is about training flexibility. It's been a massive help for me at getting better at climbing when I've struggled to make consistent gains in my finger strength. If we go back to the beginning when we looked at the differences in our male and female data set, when we're looking at finger strength, you'll notice that that's also a big confounding variable in the amount of strength required to climb a certain grade. Now, in our beginner's bouldering guide, I talked about the importance of stretching in your warm up so that you can access that range of motion before you start climbing. It's a really important part of that mobilize ramp warm up. But here, we're gonna be putting a little bit more focused intention into the intensity of our stretching. So what we're gonna look at is tempo stretching. The concept of tempo stretching is really simple, but there are a few key points you need to get right if it's gonna be effective. The idea is that we can take pretty much any weightlifting movement or weight training movement, and we can apply the concept of tempo stretching to it. So this means that we need to move slowly with a tempo prescribed through the eccentric portion, pause at the bottom, concentric portion, pause at the top. The most important part to pay attention to is the lowering phase. You can't enter a stretch fast if you want the muscle to relax and lengthen. Your muscle will actually tighten up with stretch reflex if you move into a stretch too fast, so you need to move slowly, often with a tempo of two to three seconds on the lowering portion. The second most important thing is holding that end range for time. This is a pause repetition. This is where tension is built up in the muscle at length, and this is the main driver in your flexibility. If you skip these two, you're likely to build more control, more coordination, and probably feel better in these moves, but actually increasing your range of motion is unlikely to be that effective. 
We can modify tempo to increase the time under tension at the end range, but a basic tempo to go with would be three, two, two, one. The added benefit of this is you can apply progressive overload to this form of training. So you can easily add weight if you need to increase the intensity. You can easily increase the number of repetitions, you can increase the number of sets, and you can slow down the tempo. The reason I believe tempo stretching is such a powerful tool for climbers or just any athletes looking to improve their flexibility is it's not as boring as static stretching. And that's probably the biggest hurdle for climbers to get over and the biggest reason they don't stick to stretching consistently. With this, you get to feel like you're moving weights around, you get to count reps. And I've found in my coaching practice that this is a way better tool for climbers to get enjoyment and satisfaction out of. The other reason it's such a powerful tool is to be effective in your stretching, you still need a decent amount of intensity. You need to move into your maximum tolerable limit. So this means the stretch will probably feel a bit uncomfortable. Obviously, we don't want to move into pain and you don't want to feel pain around the joints. You're still looking for a stretch in the muscle, but it needs to be a deep stretch. With tempo stretching, you only need to hold that for two or three seconds maximum before coming out for a bit of respite. This means you can maintain the intensity, but increase the reps over time so that you still build up a good amount of time under tension at a high intensity. We'll go for a few examples here which use this tempo style of stretching. This being the butterfly or tailor's pose, the seated pancake, and also the revolver stretch to hit our lats and side obliques as well. Don't get me wrong, static stretching is still an excellent way of gaining flexibility. You just need to do it more frequently and have more volume, spend more time doing it because the intensity won't be as high as this kind of stuff. I'm still likely to do some sort of static stretching alongside this tempo stretching. This stuff is likely gonna to be too intense to do before a climbing session. So I'll do it after a climbing session or on a separate training day when I'm focusing on strength and conditioning. The benefit of doing this is I am only gonna prescribe this once to twice a week at most for my clients that are training with tempo stretching. That's because the intensity is high and you're gonna get a strength training stimulus from this. Another thing to note that's probably really important for some people to hear is that when you're using weights with this type of stretching, you're very unlikely likely to go heavy with this one. We're always using light weights because we are one playing around with exercises that have high leverage, like the revolver for example, that weight is really far away from my pivot point on my hips. So this feels heavy when I'm holding it out that far. And also we're exploring our end range of motion. So our muscles are lengthened and mechanically very weak in that position. So a small amount of weight goes a long way for these exercises. As you get stronger, you can definitely explore about adding weight into it but we're still only just using enough weight to take us deeper into a stretch than we would otherwise go. If you go too heavy, you're more likely to just plateau and get horrendous doms in your muscles because this type of stretching can definitely cause muscle soreness like you would get from any other weight training session. Don't forget to head down to the link in the description below to enter for your chance to win a year's supply of Magdust Chalk. That is certainly one of the best ways to break through your plateau in climbing. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.